My name is Dr. Sabrina Bajwa. I'm a consultant in palliative medicine and I'm a clinical senior lecturer. Racial inequality is something that is well known within palliative care. Patients who are from ethnically diverse backgrounds are known to not have as much access to palliative care as those from the white British population in the UK. What we do know, and certainly something that I saw clinically whilst working during the COVID pandemic, is those inequalities in access seem to increase. And what we don't know is why that was the case. In 2021, we conducted research to assess how palliative care services delivered care to ethnically diverse patients during the COVID pandemic, the COVPAL project. Using an online questionnaire, we collected responses from 277 UK palliative care services. We found that UK-wide policies instigated during the COVID pandemic may have disproportionately affected those from ethnically diverse groups. We also found that the palliative care response during the COVID pandemic may have been equal but inequitable. Whilst we've done this research and uh, published a paper, what we wanted to do was develop an educational film for all those who work in palliative care to really improve the understanding of what the needs of these uh, ethnically diverse patients are. And so with it, we can improve the care that we deliver to them going forward. We actually see quite a lot of ethnic diverse patients and it's very, very important for us to be mindful of the importance of culture, belief, religion, because that is what makes them whole. A couple of weeks ago, I had to go onto a ward and the family was in the corridor and they hadn't been given access to the relatives room because they'll come in and they'll be going in and out, in and out, but that right was taken away from them. I was able to challenge the ward sister of a white British background saying, why haven't you allowed them access to that relative's room? Why have they not had that time? They will go into the room and visit the patient in twos and threes if that's what you want, but let them sit together and, and mourn together and pray together because that's what's important to them. If the system in place does not understand the community that it's serving, it's very, very difficult because then it does probably feel like a good death in, in the professional's eyes is being enforced on that loved one or on that family. Lots of frustration comes around end of life when someone is imminently dying and relatives' needs aren't met. Your emotions are heightened, you know, we all have emotional attachment and especially for that relative who's attached to that patient, their emotions are all over the place. You will get conflict and when the conflict arises then the complaints come in and the needs are addressed and I think it reduces a lot, a lot of that conflict as well. In certain communities, such as in um, the Black Caribbean community from which my mother came, the fear about going into hospital is that you're going to die. And that, that was very much true from my mother's view um, when my grandmother died. Even though I'm in palliative care and I could explain a lot of things to her from my point of view, it didn't take away the mistrust of the system because that's built up over generations. Equal care is treating everybody the same giving everybody the same resources, but actually some people need more resources. Some people need more resources so that they can have the same outcomes as the person next to them. So actually, what is more important than treating everybody equally is to treat everybody equitably. And that means giving uh, everybody the, the resources that they need to achieve the same outcome. When, when somebody walks in from a particular community, you may already have preconceived ideas and have some kind of unconscious bias about how you're going to treat those people compared to other people. Stereotyping somebody just because of their, their, their colour or, or, or their appearance, you have started kind of, kind of one, judging that person, secondly, kind of, of, of putting that person in a different bracket, assuming that whatever I'm going to give the person, they don't need it. There is a possibility that we stereotype 
people, especially people from the Pentecostal movement, one would say they don't want to talk about death and dying. They don't want to talk about the end of life or even put plans in place. Oh, they don't believe they're dying. That's stereotyping. I think that um, there is a perception that um, some communities um, look after each other and don't need anything else. Um, but I'm not sure when we last asked, when we last checked, um, when we last explored that, when we built the trust for people to say, actually, we could really do with some support. I think in terms of improving cultural competency, I think it's got to be, I think there's got to be huge listening experience. I think people need to listen to the patients and kind of observe and sort of see what it is that the patients actually want. I think a lot of people um, from diverse ethnic groups might be used to cultural incompetency and they just accept that as a given that that's the norm um, and they just kind of go with it. So the onus has got to be on us to learn. I think sometimes the other thing people is people worry about doing things wrong uh, or worry about saying the wrong thing. And I think you know, being politically correct or accidentally upsetting people. And I think if we come from a position of, of kindness and compassion and curiosity and having those conversations about what matters to people, from that place, it's actually quite hard to do it wrong. I think it's conversations and learning from lived experience. So thinking about what sort, so what have you experienced at work? What things have you found difficult and challenging? And having those open, honest conversations that, you know what, when, so as a white member of the staff working on a ward, when a South Asian person comes, is admitted on my ward, I find it difficult to manage visitors. So starting off by having that conversation and then talking to people within the hospital environment who might be able to support you with that. A couple of weeks ago, one of my colleagues came to me and she said, do you think if I went to go see one of these patients I'm going to see, and if I said, "Assalamu alaikum, would they take offence from me? I said, no, they will not at all. You will be welcomed in. Understanding what death means to that community is so important. That's, if you like, for palliative care, that could be your starting point. What does death mean to this community? When you see large number of pa large numbers of visitors visiting Muslim patients, the first most important thing, and here at Bradford, this is the message that we get across and it is accepted, it's just making staff understand why they are coming in the first place. Why when a Muslim patient is ill in hospital or an Asian patient, why do we get so many visitors coming to see that person? So trying to understand through training, we do a lot of training now, it's really becoming more and more popular. We do um, religious and cultural awareness training in the hospital. It was popular years ago, 20 years ago, and it stopped and we've brought that back in again. We live in a very Western society. We're a Western hospital. There's white British culture and I think often the needs of our South Asian population are missed um, through no fault of anyone's but there's lack of knowledge of what our needs are at the end of life, how we mourn, how we grieve, how we accept death and what we'd like at the end of life. I accidentally and unintentionally bring power as somebody um, from a white British community and that feels uncomfortable. Um, I don't want to, to be seen to have that power. I know I come from a position of privilege um, that I've accidentally acquired and I'm very grateful for. But I want to, what I feel like it's really important to do is to use that accidental position of power and privilege to champion the needs of those who don't have that and make sure that those people are getting the care and support instead of being forgotten about. Another finding from our COVPAL research was sometimes there was a tendency to uh, place the deficit on patients and families from ethnically diverse groups. There are terms like hard to reach um, that suggests again that it's these individuals, it's these communities that have something with them that make it difficult for them to interact with the services rather than acknowledging that maybe our services are the things that are hard to reach, that maybe we put barriers in place for those individuals 
individuals be, to be able to access those services, whether that be something as simple as, you know, not having a religious figure on the front of a hospice, or whether that be not having the representation, not having people who can speak the language, not having people who understand the culture. Um, there's so many ways that we make our services hard to reach, um, but it's much easier for us to frame it as, you know, they, you know, here we are. Look, we we can provide all this stuff to us. You just you're just not coming. Like, why aren't you coming? I've kind of had this dawning realization that we've had this kind of, oh well, if only they'd listen to us they'd suddenly realise that actually we could do so much good work with people. But that's, that's really arrogant. Thinking about the traditional deficit model that we've used for these groups uh, requires us to revisit the animation model. The problem with this uh, graphic is where the initial deficit is located. Those people who are ethnically diverse uh, need more support to see over the fence. Not because the fence is of a greater height for them, but because they are shorter. An issue inherent to the person themselves. This metaphor is actually a great example of deficit thinking, an ideology that blames the ethnically diverse patients for their situation. The following is a much better way of thinking about this. This image shows all the people, including the ethnically diverse person, looking over the fence are the same height. But the reason why the ethnically diverse person can't see over the fence is because the fence is higher and the ground is lower. To me, this is true equality and equity. I guess we have to hold our hands up and say the way we practice our policy is geared towards more um, people from the dominant culture. Um, I think they've informed policy and practice and being the people who are leading the specialty in the UK more so. And I think their voices have been heard more. I, d I think it'd be unfair to say they haven't, we haven't heard people from more disadvantaged backgrounds uh, other than that, because I think we have, but I don't think we've centred on it, as, as, as you say. I think that's what we haven't done. We haven't centred on the margins. We haven't, it's kind of been like, this is what we want to do and, you know, there's these other people that are kind of missing out or we could do something different. And it's very easy to be able to say, well, we're representative of our community, but by doing so, we're not, we're not changing the nature of the face of hospice care at all. There's very few communities where there is no ethnic diversity. So I think that within, within healthcare generally, I think we don't always have this great understanding of different ethnicities. And I do think in some ways, you know, there's one of the reasons for that is that we're often the hierarchies of the NHS and healthcare are predominantly white British people. If we're serious about reaching different communities, then actually we need that diversity of thought in terms of how we approach that, how we think about um, new solutions, new way of ways of doing things because historically hospices haven't been very good at that. They haven't been very good at reaching different people. We change the way that we do everything in terms of trustee recruitment from the way that we advertise to where we advertise to how we give people information about the organisation and how we are not scared to specifically target the fact to say you know, we want to improve the diversity of our board. It's a holistic approach to um, A, doing the right thing, but also it's just good business sense. It's good business practice because you're, you're widening the net of the people that will support. You're widening the net of the people that will volunteer, widening the net of the people that will come and work in, in the organisations. Um, and you're dealing with the criticism that comes from the NHS that we're not diverse enough. I went to the hospital the other time and um, from the name of this patient, I thought this patient was a Yoruba person. And so I come from Nigeria originally and we have more than 330 tribes, different languages. So hence, we speak different languages. Although she was from Nigeria, but still there was that barrier. But at, when I was talking to her, I realized from the way she spoke, she sounded like me. So I thought, are you from my part of Nigeria? And she said, yes. The, the reason I have a Yoruba name is because of my husband. And we went straight into our dialect. And she was very happy. She actually then felt welcome to open up and said, I definitely need your help. But prior to that, 
she wasn't willing to open up because she didn't know who I was. So it brings some sort of comfort and confidence to, to our patients. I think recruitment of people from different backgrounds is not that difficult. But I think you need to be clear why you're doing it. You need to tell people that you want them to work for you. And when them, then when they get here, they need to be made to feel welcome. And that means working with the existing staff team to make sure that they understand about their conscious and unconscious biases so that they understand that actually it will bring a strength to the team, not a weakness or a different, that difference isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. And I think it's about creating safe spaces for people to raise concerns because you won't always get it right. Uh, we certainly haven't always got it right. And there are things that happen that create challenges for people that will make people feel vulnerable. And it's much better to create safe spaces to talk about that and, and open up that conversation. And again, continue to listen to people. In all honesty, we've been guilty of sitting in the hospice and delivering a model that we've been used to delivering for the white British population. And um, we, I think, have sometimes thought, well, we'll just transfer that model to another group in the population. We need to do things differently. If you've tried to do things in one set of set manner and it's not working, you need to change. I was recently talking to some of the senior colleagues and I was saying, enriching people of my culture or dynamically diverse people is actually going to their, where they live. It's not just you shouting from a distance. You need to make your presence felt there. I know there are barriers into getting to those places, but if you don't try, how do you know you'll succeed? So I, I, I say they're not doing enough because I haven't seen anybody <laughs> coming into my community. So they need to go into those places. So that means churches again, mosques, temples and all. For my dad's care, we had a quite a positive experience. And I mean, we knew that my father was old. He was 89 years old, but right until the last stages of his life, he was quite active. He was offered care at the hospital, but we refused. It's cultural for us, for as a Pakistani family, to, uh, to care for our father. And we, it was a privilege for us we could phone them at any time. We don't always know best. And we obviously have a perspective and a load of expertise and skills, which can be really helpful. But it's only skillful if you adapt it and apply it to the relevant setting that you're in. And if you kind of have an approach that says, well, it's my way or no way, then that's not, that's not what we're about. Palliative care is supposed to be holistic. It's supposed to be personalised. It's supposed to be you know, getting alongside the individual and travelling on their journey, not our journey. It's really important that we measure outcomes such as patient reported outcome measures and uh, referral rates and look at those uh, related to our local population. It should be routine that we collect outcomes broken down by ethnicity. Data is powerful and data will allow us to allocate more resources or allocate our resources differently to ensure that we are able to achieve the same outcomes for all of our patients, including our ethnically diverse patients. We often don't know our blind spots until we start looking for them. Outcomes are really important to hold our services and hold ourselves, I count myself, to account for us to know whether we are making the differences that matter um, and if not that we continue to work hard to, to address them. Another finding from our COVPAL research was that there was a strong focus on uh, delivery of individualised or personalised care. Focusing on individualised or personalised care alone ignores the structural and organisational factors which are in place which influence the care that we deliver to ethnically diverse patients.
Structural racism is present if uh, organisations do not mitigate policies uh, which may impact one ethnic group over another. There's been a lot of positive advances. You know, palliative care comes from almost a social justice issue that death and dying weren't considered as being important. Um, and, and I think we're really well placed to take on you know, things like racial inequality as a social justice issue um, around healthcare. Um, but we've got to also self-reflect and recognise what are those structures and systems that have allowed us for the last few decades since palliative care was created to allow these inequalities to exist, to not prioritise critiquing them and not prioritise action around them. There's never going to be enough money in hospices, in healthcare, and there's never going to be enough staff. So we're always dealing in a situation where there's limited resources to the best, most maximum impact. And that means that we need to not provide a platinum service to a small number of people, but actually to try and have an impact on a greater number of people even if that means that those people all get slightly less, in my view. And that means that we have to think about the way that we provide care um, ourselves, but also in partnership with other people, to provide care which is relevant to our local community. So we're not trying to do things that actually people don't want, because that's a waste of money and time, but also that we meet those with the greatest need. We mustn't blame or shame each other for not having had these discussions before. It's really only in the last few years that we've started to have these discussions and obviously Covid was a big launch pad for this and you know I, I, I sometimes feel embarrassed. Why have I not been involved in work to do with um, ethnicity before? Why have we not been discussing this before? This is This has always been there and whether it's because you, we're trained in the Western style, all our textbooks at medical school have got white skins when you learn dermatology. When you think about it carefully, those, those things don't work if you're looking at a brown or a dark, a dark skin, skin tone. And it's only in the last two years when people have started to challenge this. So we must not blame anybody that the conversations haven't happened, but we do need to challenge that they should happen and that they shouldn't be just put to the side and um, this is something that's now that we should be doing now and thinking about. And if we park the fact that we might not know how to afford it and we might not know what exactly the models of care look like, but let's say we've, we've, got, we've got there, then if we can do it in palliative and end of life care, it can happen in every part of society. If we can get it right at that point where people are at their most vulnerable, then we can do it we can get it right. So I think if we can get this, this, um, if we can move forward be beyond the, bar the barriers, the barriers that we put up about resources and capacity and, and everything else, I think if we can get through those barriers and really find a way of making this work, then it should be able to be part of a blueprint for a, a fairer and more equitable country. <laughs>